So uh, now we'd like to introduce uh, Brandon Bubba Brooks from Kaleido Biosciences, who's going to talk about the NICU microbiome's role in neonate gut colonization. All right, hi, uh, I'm Bubba Brooks. I uh, just graduated from Joel Banfield's lab at UC Berkeley. I'm gonna talk to you about some of my dissertation work on, and that was a great uh, primer Maria gave uh, to some of this work. We're studying uh, preterm infants housed in intensive care units and how intensive care unit, uh, the microbes on surfaces in intensive care units uh, colonize infants during their hospital stay. Um, okay, okay. Uh, so, to start off, uh, just to make the point that it's, it's still really difficult to clean hospitals, Maria presented uh, the micrograph of uh, skin flakes in an operating room, intensive care units, uh, neonatal, the particular neonatal intensive care unit we study is cleaned every 24 hours. This, this uh, study was looking at a hospital that was decommissioned, uh, they were going to tear it down. Uh, they cleaned it in a two-step terminal cleaning with 500 ppm chlorine treatment. Scientists came in and took samples from wallpaper, sofas, uh, doors. They stored those samples for 12 months at room temperature. Uh, and then they came back and did sequencing, viability testing, multi-drug resistance testing. Um, and what you can see in this micrograph, uh, red is dead, green is alive, and they're staining. Um, there's a lot of dead cells uh, in this uh, equipment box. This uh, sample, however, is the main entry door to the intensive care unit, and so you can see that there's a lot of green viable cells. Um, the point being, it, it's, it's difficult to uh, remove polymicrobial biofilms and, and these uh, microbes that are sticking to the surfaces of these hospital surfaces. And, and of course, we care about this because nosocomial infections are still a massive problem in the U.S., $30 billion a year. Um, it continues to be a big issue. Um, but the overall model system for, uh, for this work, and Maria, Maria uh, introduced some of this, babies are born sterile, uh, particularly the babies we study are treated with antibiotics for the first few days or weeks of life. So the inoculum they would typically get from the vaginal canal or through cesarean process is largely removed through um, antibiotic administration. Uh, and then as I just pointed out, uh, these surfaces are not near sterile. And so if you put a near sterile blank, a blank template of a baby uh, in a room, uh, anything that gets into it, it, it's a nice way to characterize uh, room occupant interactions. Okay. So the talk is divided into two main sections. Uh, as Paula mentioned earlier, we have an ongoing NIH project over several years, um, cohorts of infants. And so while that that funding was uh, looking at different aspects of infant gut colonization. The, the Sloan Foundation allowed us to look at room surfaces and microbes on room surfaces to see how they interact with the baby during its gut colonization process. Um, so the first part of the talk is going to be focused on the data from the infant gut uh, fecal sample perspective, and then we'll move into uh, the room, room environment perspective. Okay, and just a brief mention on our workflow. Um, most of the data I'll show you today, uh, we lyse cells, we get genomic DNA, we do deep shotgun sequencing, we use a favorite software assembler. I can talk about these in detail later if you want to talk about it, but uh, we, use, we then assemble the contigs and then we do genome binning so that each bin represents a discrete strain of microbe. So with the whole objective in the end is to say, uh, we have this strain on a surface, uh, does it get into the baby, or do we see a strain in a baby, does it get onto a surface? Is the general idea. Okay, and so um, using strain resolved metagenomics is, is great because it gives you a nuanced perspective of infant gut colonization. So here is, is one of our NIH cohorts, babies one through 10, day of life is underneath that. And for example, uh, this baby has an Enterococcus faecalis strain, infant one, kind of hard to see, infant one. Uh, has this strain on, or infant two has a strain on day of life one through three, um, and you can see that no other infant has this particular strain. 
Um, but if you look at, um, for example, this Clostridium parapetrificum, infant three or infant two has this strain on day of life seven. Infant five gets this strain on day of life one through three. It's treated with antibiotics, acquires a different strain, but then reacquires the same strain. Infant six gets the same strain, and infant eight has the same strain. So the same strain is quite pervasive in this cohort of, of 10 infants. And every strain here colored in red is a strain that's shared by multiple infants. And so you have six species here. Three of the strains, or three of the species have strains shared across infants. And so that would indicate that there's lots of strain sharing in a hospital, or at least infants housed in the same place at the same time. Um, it's a bit misleading because that's, that's a close-up of a, of a bigger analysis we did. In this particular analysis, uh, we assembled 149 strains, and only four uh, were shared across infants in this particular cohort. And so the main message here is that there's loads of strain diversity uh, available to infants housed in an intensive care unit. Um, and very few of the, the strains are shared uh, were the results from this study. Uh, as I mentioned, we have an ongoing NIH cohort in the lab, and each panel here is representing a 2011 to 2014 cohort, so they're separated by, by roughly two to three years. Um, and what you can see in green are all of the strains that are shared across years. Um, so, for example, uh, this Pseudomonas aeruginosa was an infant three, and it was also an infant two, and a cohort separated by several years, um, potentially indicating that there's a localized source that, that's seeding these infants. Other interesting things that came out of uh, this analysis uh, that was published in, in ISMI, um, there are siblings, and uh, siblings, they came from the same mother at the same time. Uh, you, you, would, you would expect that potentially some of the source inocula that came from the mother um, may stick around. And while this is speculative, we don't have data on the mother, um, one could speculate this Haemophilus parainfluenzae para or these strains here that were not shared by any other babies in, in these two cohorts were potentially maternally sourced where you have things like um, E. fecalis, uh, where it's one sibling received and the other one did not, um, yet this strain is uh, pervasive uh, and, and sourced um, quite regularly in these cohorts. Okay, and so um, from the infant data, what we've learned so far, uh, there are a multitude of strains capable of colonizing um, infants in, in this ICU. Uh, strains are largely not shared among co-housed infants in the data that I've shown. And uh, strains persist for years uh, in the NICU, at least in the babies that are continually admitted to this NICU. Okay, so now what, what can the room information tell us? Okay, so in, in designing this experiment, uh, this is at a hospital a clinician collaborator, uh, Mike Morowitz, uh, at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh and McGee Women's Hospital. Um, at this hospital, each infant has their own uh, room, so it's a private style neonatal intensive care unit. Um, and all of the babies that we study are low birth weight, uh, low gestation. Um, we track the baby's day of life 5 to 28. Uh, we collected 22 different surface types using a variety of techniques, swabs, wipes, bioaerosol sampling. We also did passive petri dish dust collection. Um, and uh, importantly, and Maria mentioned this a little bit, there, there is no skin-to-skin -skin contact. These babies, there's no kangaroo care. Um, they're always in their, their uh, isolate or their incubator for the duration of this sampling period. We also did quite extensive work in collaboration with Bill Nazaroff, characterizing relative humidity, occupancy, temperature. Um, unfortunately, I don't have enough time to go into this today, uh, but I'd be happy to talk about that as well. Okay, and so um, this is the first data slide from that uh, experiment. And what we also did, so we did uh, 16S sequencing. We also did uh, biomass qualification. So on the x-axis are the different environments that we sampled, and on the y-axis are 16S counts quantified via droplet digital PCR, which is a variant of qPCR to just count how many DNA templates there are of 16S. And the first thing you'll note across environments, uh, there's a wide uh, range of bacterial density, uh, three to four orders of magnitude difference across different environment types. Um, things that are frequently, uh, surfaces that are frequently touched, uh, like uh, computer mice, handrails, countertops, uh, they have a generally the same bacterial density. 
Um, hands varied a little bit because we didn't normalize occasionally. We would uh, collect hand samples from parents or nurses before, after washing their hands, before or after <coughs> touching the baby. Um, so that information is a bit obscured here. Um, the highest bacterial density uh, in the NICU itself are sink basins. Uh, several people have mentioned where there's water, you'll have higher bacterial densities. Um, the HVAC system was a bit of a positive control. It was at the outer face of the HVAC interface where supply and return air are mixed. Um, so it had a very high bacterial density, but it's a bit of an unfair comparison here. So sink samples had the highest bacterial density in, in the neonatal intensive care unit. Um, if, if I had to speculate a priori what would have a higher bacterial density, um, areas, so this is the main entrance uh, to the NICU, the, the flooring right in front of the main entrance. And this is the um, floor in front of the isolate. I would have guessed that the floor at the main entrance would have a higher bacterial density, uh, but that's not the case. It's, it's the flooring in front of the uh, incubator, and that's because there's a mo more focused occupancy uh, in front of the incubator where nurses come regularly to uh, provide health, uh, service the baby, and, and take care of the infant. Um, whereas in front of the main entrance, it's a more transient occupancy, so you don't have um, uh, as high of bacterial densities. Uh, this is also recapitulated in our bioaerosol uh, data where if you look at, there were uh, large and small size fractions for different size cutoffs of, of bioaerosols, but the, but the take home message here is if you look um, within the infant's room versus the hallway where the hallway has more transient occupancy, there are higher bioaerosol loads within the infant's room than in the, uh, the hallway samples. Other things you can do with are interesting uh, trends we found with the biomass data. Um, Monday through Friday, um, we noticed a trend in the sink basin samples. Um, at the beginning of the week, there was a high, amount of, a high amount of biomass, and throughout the week, as uh, the hygiene staff cleaned, uh, there was removal of sink biomass, um, all linked to the, the hygiene schedule they had in, in the intensive care unit. Other things you can do with biomass data, um, so we used this uh, ratio OTU method where uh, if you quantify the biomass in your negative <coughs> controls and in your samples, you can clean the data for um, background noise. And I don't have time to go into the details, but I'm happy to talk to people about it. Uh, but we use this clean uh, data set uh, to apply a support vector machine, machine learning algorithm. And we were asking the question, um, if you have a sample, can you predict using microbiome data where that sample came from? Where did this surface swab, what room did it come from? And using this uh, classifier, we were able to, we were able to predict with a 58% accuracy uh, what, um, where a sample came from. Um, a similar method was applied by um, John Chase and Greg Caparasso in their office microbiome um, study where they were able to beat uh, random, random guessing by uh, 2x, we were able to, to beat it by 5x. Um, what this indicates is that um, each room has its own personalized microbiome, um, and, and that personalization is more personalized than, say, an office, which, which is intuitive, right? Offices have more mixing, occupancy isn't restricted like it is in an intensive care unit, um, but it's interesting that each room has its own personalized microbiome. Okay, and so um, it's a bit of a, a transition. So what this slide is showing here, uh, we did, we were able to recover genomes from uh, surfaces in the intensive care unit. So there's been a lot of, many attempts to uh, try to get genomes from low biomass samples, and there is actually a poster here um, from a researcher in Austria that you should check out, which he also um, has some, they, it's a really cool poster, you should see it. But um, what we did is we pooled many surface sample types um, because you have to do sample pooling to get enough biomass to do deep shock and sequencing. And we were able to get um, strain level resolutions uh, and get really nice genomes out of these surface samples. And so um, what you're seeing in the different colors and different columns are different cohorts from 2011 uh, to 2012. 13 and uh, 14, and then the orange are the uh, 2013 room samples, and each column represents a strain. And so, for example, we were able to assemble genomes for uh, four different Staph epi strains, um, and two of these strains were found regularly in the room. One of these strains is pervasive throughout a four-year, or 
from 2011 to 2014 in this NICU environment, in infant gut samples um, and in this one year in the room samples where we have metagenomic data for. Um, Maria mentioned uh, Interbacteriaceae. Um, one of the more frequent um, colonizers is Klebsiella pneumoniae, um, which was in all of the cohorts. Um, we also uh, get, we, we isolate that in, in room samples as well. Um, so, showing similar data um, on the y-axis are different strains, and what this is indicating here, uh, so, so first, stars indicate uh, where we have room data matched to infant gut genomes. So, um, for example, this Pseudomonas aeruginosa uh, up here uh, colonized infant 5, and uh, it was found in infant five uh, swab sinks and wipe samples. So um, because there's no temporal difference that they were collected at the same time, you can't really tell directionality. So you can't tell if the baby's gut microbiome is getting all over the room or, um, or vice versa. But uh, in these red boxes, you can see, for example, um, this Aramona's colonized infant eight uh, here, uh, indicated by infant eight, Aramona's. Um, but uh, we detected it in infant five's swab samples uh, several months earlier. So indicating at least that this identical strain was available um, for, for, to, to colonize an infant. Um, you also see that, for example, with this club's yellow pneumonia, uh, it colonized um, infant 15, and we detected this club's yellow pneumonia in sinks uh, of infant nine and in uh, the wipe samples of infant nine. Um, suggesting that, uh, that the room, identical strains can persist in the room and make their way and, and thrive in infants. Um, continuing the story about Klebsiella pneumoniae because it is a problematic critter, um, the, the, the Klebsiella pneumoniae that was in infant six um, experienced a crash and then it was replaced by another Klebsiella pneumoniae late in uh, infant six's time series. This, this first strain of Klebsiella pneumoniae was identical to the strain in infant five, uh, in infant five sink samples. So this is an environmentally sourced, we believe environmentally sourced um, strain from the sink that is outcompeted by a gut sample or a gut, a gut strain that is, is better adapted. And why we think it's a gut strain that's better adapted um, is that if you look um, within the gut and you do IREP calculations or you try to calculate the activity um, of, of, these, of this Klebsiella using um, chromosomal replication calculation. What you can see is that um, strain two has a higher uh, activation, or it has a higher metabolic rate uh, when it's in the gut relative to strain uh, one. But if you look at strain one when it's in a sink, it has a higher replication rate um, than when it's in the gut indicating that this first strain is better adapted to live in sink environments, while this second strain is better adapted to live in gut environments. Okay, and so what have we learned from, from the, the room data? Uh, certainly the room is a reservoir for a subset of infant colonizers. Um, cleaning and occupancy are main drivers of NICU bacterial density and, and composition. I didn't have time to show the composition data. Um, but I'm happy to later if you'd like to see it. Um, strains persist for several years in, in the NICU, um, and they can on room surfaces. And also, we're seeing evidence of room and gut partitioning, um, so it'd be interesting to see if you could form some type of intervention there. And also, just a, a general, um, very crude model, but uh, I didn't go into this in detail, but almost all the strains we see in the infant, we can detect getting on, on room surfaces. Um, and then we occasionally see a feedback back to infants. And so it's not that um, everything in a gut can live on room surfaces. I think there are uh, a subset that are really good at thriving and, and tolerating room surfaces uh, in hopes of finding a more favorable environment later. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, and so with that, I'd like to thank the Sloan Foundation that, that funded a majority of, of my dissertation work. Um, I'd like to thank Jill. Um, for having me in our lab is a wonderful experience. Mike Morowitz, who provided a lot of support in, in cohorting and, and a lot of medical advice. 
um, uh, Matt, who's here, who's, who's continuing the, the Sloan work in the lab. Um, all, of, all of the undergrads, it wouldn't have been possible without them. We uh, collected thousands of samples that I didn't have time to talk to today. And then also the support from the research staff in, in Pittsburgh. Um, yeah, and thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thanks for the great talk, Bubba. Um, question about how specific you think the findings are to the context of babies in a NICU, and could we assume some of this to generalize, uh, or is it dangerous to do so? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think um, babies that have never experienced a mature microbiome um, and are particularly susceptible to their environment it is difficult to, to generalize. I think there needs to be more um, cohorts on, or more investigation on critically ill patients, people that have uh, ongoing antibiotic treatment or are about to have bone marrow, or transplants, chemotherapy patients. I think it's potentially generalizable, but, um, and there are some, some studies looking at that, but I think there needs to be more data generated to really get at that generalization, but I think Critically ill patients would be the first place I would look to start to generalize, yeah. Sure, babies in the NICU are, use feeding tubes, uh, most of them I thought. Mm -hmm. uh, did you look at any feeding tube associated microbiota and compare it in any way? One would wonder if that's a site colonization of certainly Enterobacteria. Right, so the, the question is the, the feeding tubes. In a, in a pilot study we did, and we, we did see a, a, a big overlap in feeding tubes and what was in the gut. Um, the way the study was designed, we couldn't really get it directionality too much. We couldn't do it for the follow-up study for um, some <coughs> compliance reasons and, and some IRB issues, and so we, we didn't manage to get that for the follow-up study. But I do think that those, those types of devices would be interesting to collect on. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.